How does it feel to raise someone from the dead? Well, I'll tell you, it feels great. <laughs> it feels amazing. There's truly nothing like it. Uh, it definitely makes me feel like I'm one of the most powerful men in the universe. Now, you might be thinking, get out of here, Father Ricardo. You've never raised anyone from the dead. Well, think again, because yes, I have. <laughs> Lots of times in baptism and confession. Through these readings about people being raised from the dead, the church is inviting us to recognize and rejoice that our Lord Jesus Christ does raise souls from spiritual death to divine life through his priests in the sacraments. Yes, that miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead was particularly amazing. Our Lord had raised other people from the dead, the daughter of Jairus, the synagogue leader, also the, the son of the widow of Nain, but they had only been dead a little while. Lazarus had been dead four days. They say there will be a stench. And St. John Chrysostom suggests that the people actually smelled the stench when they rolled away the tomb. They smelled the stench of death, and, and then our Lord tells them to come forth, and they see him alive. So it was particularly amazing that our Lord is powerful enough even to raise a dead, putrefying body back to life. But even so, as amazing as that is... God wants to do something even more amazing. God's greater desire is to raise our souls from spiritual death to divine life. Our Lord, in speaking to Martha, draws attention to this. He speaks of a resurrection beyond the bodily resurrection of Lazarus. A resurrection beyond the bodily resurrection of everybody at the end of time. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. He who believes in me, even though he die, shall live. Those words do not make sense unless we realize that he is contrasting two different types of life. The natural life that we have as human beings of body and soul, but also there's the divine life that share in sanctifying grace that he wants to give us. That divine life that Adam and Eve had at the beginning and they lost through the original sin. And because of that sin, now all of us are conceived and born into the world, so to speak, half dead, with only one of the types of life that God wanted for us. God doesn't just mean for us to have this human life, but to share in divine life, which we need to go to heaven. We need to share in his divine life to go to heaven. And so we are we come into this world stillborn, spiritually stillborn. We do not have sanctifying grace when we are born into the world. But in baptism, in that beautiful sacrament, God quickens the soul to divine life by the Holy Spirit. And if we commit that, the, the mortal sin, right, serious sin, with full knowledge and full consent of the will, we die spiritually. We lose sanctifying grace. Christ raises the soul to life in confession. This is the fulfillment of that prophecy in the first reading in Ezekiel. God saying, O my people, I will open your graves and have you rise from them. O my people, he says it twice. You will know that I am and the Lord when I open your graves and have you rise from them. This is not just talking about the resurrection of the body. Right? This is talking about the resurrection of the soul. This is how the fathers of the church interpreted our Lord raising people from the dead. It's been there for centuries. The fathers of the church, they talk about the raising of the daughter of Jairus from the dead. This took place in, the, in her home. And they say, this can represent the, our serious sins that we commit in our, in our thoughts and desires. When we consent to evil desires or we commit secret mortal sins, that's the, represented there. Uh, then we have the son of the widow of Nain who was raised from the dead outside the gate of the city. The fathers of the church interpret this meaning the, the mortal sins that we commit in action or in public. And then there's the raising of Lazarus from the tomb. This can represent those souls who are buried, so to speak, in habits of mortal sin. But no matter how long they've been there, 
our Lord still has the power to raise them from the dead. And the fathers of the church also interpret that he does this through his priests. We've believed this from the beginning. St. Augustine points out that our Lord calls, for, calls Lazarus forth to come out, but he instructs others to untie him. Untie him and let him go. Unbind him. And St. Augustine says that our Lord is the one, this represents our Lord is the one who calls us to repentance and moves us to repentance of our sins, but he works through his ministers to unbind us. Right? The, the people he told to unbind him, this represents his priests who unbind our souls from these sins in confession. This can make us think of our Lord's words in Matthew 18 to his apostles. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then there's his words in John 20. He breathes the Holy Spirit on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them. Whose sins you retain are retained. So yes, priests have this power. When I say that I've risen souls from the dead, of course it's not just me by myself on my own power. It's God at work uh, through me as an instrument. Sure, he doesn't need to work through the priest, but he chooses to do so. In that miracle, our Lord calls on God the Father. I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me. Well, as God himself, he didn't have to call on God the Father, but he is working this miracle through his human nature. And so he shows this, this conjoint work between God the Father and the Son of God incarnate in the sacrament of baptism and confession, our Lord associates the priest with his own saving human nature. He said to St. Faustina, were a soul like a decaying corpse so that from a human point of view there would be no hope of restoration and all, all hope would be lost? He says, it is not so with God. The miracle of divine mercy restores that soul in full. So yes, it's amazing to raise a person bodily from the dead after four days, but it's even more amazing to raise a soul from the dead after four or 14 or more than 40 years. Uh, it truly feels like being a superhero. You might have heard me say it before, uh, but I'll say it again. It's worth repeating. So if somebody walks out of there after having years of mortal sin, I'm flexing in there. I'm like, yeah. Oh, mm, yes, I feel so awesome, right? And even, even if there hasn't been mortal sin, if there's only been venial sin, we want to recognize there's still the sense of uh, raising the soul to life. We need to realize that even our venial sins introduce an element of death into our life. They introduce an element of death into our soul. Sure, they're not mortal sins. They don't completely kill the life of God in our soul. We don't lose sanctifying grace altogether, but we still wound that relationship with God. And we, by resisting that temptation, we were meant to grow a little bit in divine life. That life of Christ was meant to grow in us. And so by giving into that temptation, we have, we have caused the death of that growth. Now that growth isn't going to happen there in that moment as it was meant to. And so we die a little bit. Uh, there's a song. Every time you say goodbye, I die a little. Well, we can interpret that to be true of our, even our venial sins. When we say goodbye to Jesus, when we give in to that temptation, we refuse to resist it, we die a little bit. The life of Christ dies a little bit in us. And uh, our relationship with God is wounded. Our relationship with the church is wounded. Some people say, well, I go to God directly and repent of my sins. Well, we need to recognize our sins do not just offend God and wound our relationship with him. Our sins, even our venial ones, also wound the church, the mystical body of Christ. St. Paul says, when one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. So our, it's very fitting that our Lord has arranged it that we go before his chosen representative, one of his chosen representatives of the church and repent of those sins. And then God restores us to life through the priest. It's so satisfying to absolve people of sins in confession. It's all the more satisfying when there are tears, when people cry in confession. I love hearing people cry. 
in confession. <laughs> uh, we, we hear in the gospel, Jesus wept for Lazarus and the people responded, see how much he loved him. <laughs> when people cry in confession, it's a clear sign. See how much they love him. They love Jesus. They recognize how much God has loved them and that they have failed to return love for love. Right? So a person in there may be choking up, getting all stuttered uh, about their words. <laughs> I forget much. Uh, I love that. Right? <laughs> and they might feel embarrassed. I'm like, don't. Right? Uh, those tears of repentance console the sacred heart of Jesus. They cry tears of repentance. I cry tears of joy. <laughs> uh, when I hear those repentant tears, it's like music to my ears. Right? It's so satisfying. Here's a soul that is going to appreciate what God is doing for them in this sacrament, in this, this miracle of divine mercy. <laughs> Another awesome thought, how many souls can a priest raise from the dead at once? Uh, this came to my mind when I read St. Augustine's commentary. He says, our Lord calls Lazarus forth by name that he might not bring out all the dead. I love that image. <laughs> Imagine if our Lord had just said, come forth without Lazarus' name. And then there's a whole bunch of people rising from the dead and coming forth. And everyone's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> It'd be a little overkill, right? Or I guess over rising <laughs> from the dead. <laughs> uh, and the, so the thought came to mind, oh yeah, this is possible. Uh, the church teaches in danger of death, when there's not sufficient time to hear everyone's confession, the priest can grant a general absolution, right? Everybody be sorry for your sins. And he's able to absolve them from their sins all at once. So if there were various souls with mortal sins, they're all being raised from the dead at once in that moment. I had a dream about this one time that I was with a group of people. We were in this auditorium and some men came in with guns and we all hit the floor as they started killing people. And as I was on the floor and I'm like kind of scared myself, I look across under an another table and there's this woman there and she's looking at me. She's like, <laughs> like, come on, Father, like do your thing. And I'm like, oh, oh yeah, uh, be sorry for your sins. I absolve you for your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Sure, it was only a dream, but this is possible right, in real life, and it's amazing. Right? All you young men out there who thought that you had to give up your dream of becoming a superhero, think again. The priest is a real superhero. If you ever thought that uh, the priesthood would be boring, think again. The priesthood is amazing. It's exciting. If you thought it wouldn't be a life full of joy and full of experiences of great love, think again. It is so amazing to be an instrument of God's infinite love there in confession uh, and in baptism, right? Raising even, you know, even babies, give them divine life for the first time, right? Uh, parents who are failing to encourage vocations to the priesthood of your sons because you think that they won't be happy in that life or they could do something better, <laughs> think again, right? There's no greater blessing uh, than for your son to be called to the priesthood, and to, to be this minister uh, for souls. If you ever thought that it's not worth the sacrifices that the church requires of her priests, think again. I love being a priest. I wouldn't trade it for the world. I encourage you to pray for more priests and for the, for the priests that we have, uh, that they will be all the more zealous about this, that they will all the more detach themselves from things of the world uh, to be able to pour themselves out more fully in bringing souls to life in Christ. I think a very fitting uh, finishing thought is uh, the, the fact that the church is revising part of the words of the formula of absolution in English. You might not have heard of this, uh, but it started effective Ash Wednesday. Priests were able to start using the new formula and it will be mandatory by uh, Divine Mercy Sunday. What's the change in the words? You know, especially if you haven't heard these words of absolution in a while. So the, the regular words, you, God the Father of mercies through the death and resurrection of his Son has reconciled the world to himself and sent the Holy Spirit among us for the forgiveness of sins. That's what we've heard for years. The change in the formula is going to be instead of sent the Holy Spirit among us, has poured out the Holy Spirit. And I like this. Uh, I, I, it actually reflects more the, what is said in the Spanish. Ha derramado el Espíritu Santo. Has poured out the Holy Spirit. 
and sure, sent the Holy Spirit among us, right? That's true. Uh, but I think these words convey a greater sense of the abundance of God's love and mercy that he is pouring forth in that sacrament. The idea also of the blood and water from Jesus being poured forth on our souls in that sacrament has poured out the Holy Spirit. And then it goes on, through the ministry of the church, usually we hear, may God give you pardon and peace. But one other word has gotten changed. May God grant you pardon and peace. Again, kind of the same idea, gives you, grants you. But grant, I think, carries more the sense of a great gift, an amazing gift, this incredible gift of divine mercy and being raised from the dead in confession that we are receiving. So let, let us be renewed through this. Uh, let us appreciate it all the more. And especially for our priests, right? this can be a, a source of great renewal uh, to fight off any sense of routine in there and to be able to hear sins and confession and pronounce those words of absolution as if it were our first, our last, and our only time participating in this great miracle. God love you. <laughs>